blessing. Before we have the children's church to dismiss, let me just say, well, they can go ahead. Go ahead, children's church. What a blessing to hear that song that the ladies led. People need the Lord. Perfect time to, to sing that song because it goes well with the message. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter number 5. When you get there, stand with me with the Bible in hand. Luke chapter number 5. I want to speak to you on the subject, learning to fish. Learning to fish. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. You follow along with me as I'll read this aloud for you. Luke 5, verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him, Christ, to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draw, or for a catch. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord." For he was astonished at all that were with him at the draught or the catch of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father. We're so grateful to be back in church today on the Lord's Day. We thank you for those who assemble in your house together. Thank you for the Sunday school Bible study time of studying your word in each of the classes. We pray, God, that you would bless the message now, Lord, as we've even heard in that beautiful song, how so much need is in our world, and we all need to learn to fish for the souls of men. Bless this message, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. There's an old Chinese proverb that made its way into the English language. It says this, Give a man a fish, and you feed him for a day. Show a man how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. There's a principle in that old adage that applies well to the kind of fishing that we as Christians all need to learn. And that is fishing for the souls of the lost, for lost people all around the world. Evangelism, as it's commonly called, is one of the great callings, the great duties, the great obligations that every Christian has, and especially every church member serving in one of the Lord's churches. All of us need to learn how to fish. In our text from Luke 5, we see Jesus teaching a group of mostly professional fishermen how to fish, both, both literally and, of course, figuratively. As the story goes, and there's a couple of similar stories to this one in the, in the Gospels, they had been out all night. Fishermen in those days on the Sea of Galilee did most of their fishing at night. The fishing was better, the fish were more active, and so they had been out all night, but this night they had caught nothing. And in the morning they had come back and they were tired, they wanted to go home to, to sleep and rest, and they were getting their nets clean. You'd have to clean them and make sure they're ready for the next time you went out. And as they sat cleaning their nets, the Lord comes by and tells them, go out again. And you see Peter, who was the boisterous leader of always the group, he says to the Lord, Lord, we've caught nothing, we've been working hard all night. But he had already met Jesus before, this isn't their first encounter. Peter and James and John and Andrew, these four brothers and several others probably were on these boats too from the original 12 apostles. Um, Peter says to the Lord, well, Lord, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. And the Lord tells him, take it out and go out into the deep. He says, let down your nets. The Bible says, as we saw in the beautiful text, that they caught such a, a load of fish 
that one boat could not hold it. And, and James and John and the other ships come and help them pull the fish overboard into each ship. And they were so heavy with fish that they were sinking literally in the water. And so they came to the shore with a great catch. Well, the great lesson of this story is Jesus' words in the last part of verse 10. Where though they caught a lot of physical fish, and that was important. These were fishermen who made a living that way. He says, from henceforth, from now on, you will catch men. You know what our church needs more than anything else? For every one of us to learn how to fish for the souls of men. But more so to fish ourselves. And not to depend on someone else to catch fish for us. Remember this old adage I told you about? Let me, let me reword it a little bit. Would it be better for one person to catch a thousand fish or a thousand people to catch one fish? Well, I think you would agree with me. It would be much better if a thousand people learned to catch one fish because they'd have a lot more energy keep catching a lot more fish. Imagine one person catching a thousand fish. They'd be pretty much worn out and that'd be it. Teaching a thousand people would be much better. For too long, churches, even our own, have left the work of evangelism to just a few. And because of that, sadly, the catch has been so small and sporadic. Think about this, furthering that adage again, another kind of way to look at it. Don't you think ten people fishing would be more successful than one person fishing? My uncle, my uncle Steve, my mother's brother, was the first man who really took me out fishing a lot. He didn't teach me to fish, but he took me out a lot. And one thing I noticed about him, I'd go fishing with him, and I'd have one pole. And I'd be casting my one pole. He had three or four poles going all the time. He finally told me, hey man, if you want to catch fish, fish with more than one pole. <laughs> you, got, you got a lot more chances. And, and I thought that was a good idea. From then on, I've always taken several poles to fish. I don't catch a whole lot, but I still try it with more than one pole. Like every fisherman first learned how to fish, every Christian needs to learn how to fish for the lost. We cannot keep waiting for people to bring us fish. We need to be catching them ourselves. My stepfather was the first person ever taught me to fish. My biological dad, my birth father, he, he wasn't a fisherman and never taught me. He went with fishing with me later on. I kind of taught him more, but my stepdad taught me how to fish. And I was only about eight or nine years old. Never forget it. Uh, they were living out in the country, my, my mom and my stepdad. And across the street, everybody had pretty big properties, kind of a rural area. They each had about 10-acre plots or so, big, kind of big area. And there was a, there was a tank pond right in the front yard of the, our neighbors across the street. And my stepdad knew them, and they said, anybody wants to come over fishing can. So I was visiting my mother. I actually lived with my dad, but I was visiting my mom. And my stepdad said, hey, uh, Jimmy, you want to learn how to fish? And I didn't even know what fishing was. I'd never fished in my life. I knew kind of what it was about, but I never held a fishing pole to know anything about it. I'm a little eight, nine-year-old kid. And he said, come on over. So he grabbed a couple of poles and, and he went and picked up some rocks, got some worms out from the rocks, you know, underneath the rocks and took me over there. Taught me how to cast the pole out. Put a little bobber on the end, a little, little hook on the end and even put the worm on for me the first time at least. <laughs> and he said to me, now, I can't stay with you. I got to go, but here's what you do. He said, you see that bobber floating out there, that float on the water? If you see that thing go underwater, you just kind of tug up, pull your pole up and start reeling. And you'll feel if you got something on there. So he walked away. Here I am by myself. Never fished before in my life. I'm sitting there. Nobody else with me. And, I, and I, he had already cast it out for me that first time. And it was out there a ways. And I see this red and white bobber. And all of a sudden, boom, that thing went underwater. And I just grabbed the pole just like him. He told me to do it. And I just started reeling. And there was something heavy on there. You know what? I brought in that first fish. And I was hooked for life on fishing. <laughs> I love fishing ever since that time. You know what? I got some more exciting news than that. I remember the time the Lord first used me to influence someone to come to Christ. I wasn't even a Christian very long. I was saved in 1984. It was probably sometime in 1985. And I began to influence and tell people about the gospel and see people saved. And that was even more exciting than any physical fish I ever brought in on my line. And I'm telling you folks, you could have the same experience. But you've got to learn how to fish. We all have to learn how to fish. Well, let's talk about that in our points today. Learning to fish. Number one, why should we learn to fish? Why should we learn to fish? Well, first of all, because there are fish to be caught. <laughs> There's fish to be caught. 
Hey, there's a lot of lost souls in the world that need salvation. There's fish that need to be caught. You know those fish are everywhere? And they're even close by. They're close by in your life and in my life. You've got friends, family, neighbors, co-workers. Hey, there's fish all over the world. We have missionaries. They're fishing for us. We can't cast our line out there, but they're casting their lines for us. They're throwing out the net. They're throwing out the line. We need to be fishing because there's fish to be caught. Number two, we need to be fishing because they can be caught. They can be caught. You know, if my stepdad would have said to me, um, now after you throw that line out, there's no fish out there. You're not going to catch anything, but just go ahead and sit here and watch that pole for a while. It'll be fun to watch it. Do you think I'd have stayed out there very long? You know how kids' attention span is. I taught my three kids to fish, and my boys were the worst. If they didn't get a bite within five minutes after their line was in the water, they were off, dropped their pole down, they were out playing around somewhere. My daughter was a little bit more patient. But, hey, if there wasn't any fish to catch, hey, then why would we want to fish? There is fish to catch, and they can be caught. Hey, it'd be one thing to see all those fish. I've been to places where you could literally see fish swimming around. But what if they would have never taken your, your bait? What if you'd never been able to catch them? That would have been discouraging. No one would fish if you didn't think you could ever catch anything. We need to realize fishing for the souls of men is not impossible. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. Didn't he say that? In Matthew 4, in another very similar story, when the apostles were out for a night, and he came up and called the first four apostles in that text, he said to Peter, James, uh, Peter Andrew, John, uh, James, and John, I will make you fishers of men. He'll do it. See, it's not impossible. I think so many people get discouraged in the work of evangelism. So many church members. Maybe you've tried to witness to somebody. You've, you've shared your faith. And, or you, you've given them a gospel track or a booklet. Or you've uh, you know, even invited them to church to hear the gospel. And they've said no. Or they didn't come. Or they didn't you know, have any interest. And then you give up. No, it's not impossible. The Bible says that Jesus declared, I will. If it was up to us, if he said, you guys go do your best. No, he didn't say that. I will make you fishers of men. Another reason why we should learn to fish is because we care about a catch. We care about a catch, don't we? Hey, you know what? I wouldn't keep fishing if I didn't think there was fish to catch and didn't think I can get something out of it. Now, I don't catch fish every time I go. My wife will tell you that. <laughs> but I catch enough and have caught enough fish over the years to want to keep going. There is a catch out there, and I care about catching fish. You know why we need to keep fishing for men? Because we care about the souls of people. Hey, one of the great prerequisites, one of the great requirements for evangelism is that you and I care for lost souls. You know, if you don't care about people dying, to hell and going, or dying and going to hell without Christ, you won't be involved in fishing. Okay? Be honest with yourself. If you're not sharing your faith, you don't really care about the lost. The Bible says that we should have a burden. Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of men, we or knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Paul said, I know God's wrath, His terror, His judgment on the wicked. Hey, when I think of the fact I got family members that could die and go to hell any moment. Hey, we got to care about a catch. We've got people living right around this building, right in, in our and Grand Prairie and all these surrounding going to hell without Christ. Multitudes and multitudes of them. Do we care about a catch? Lastly, in this point, we are because we've been commanded to go fishing. We've been commanded to go fishing. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. It's not like, ah, oh, if you enjoy the weather, go out and fish. No, Jesus said, Go. The Great Commission that's found in all four of the Gospels, and lastly, it's in the book of Acts. It's all about going. He's basically saying, let me keep it with our symbol, our analogy today, go fishing. Go into all the world. Preach the Gospel to every creature. Make disciples of all nations. As the Father has sent me, even so now send I you. These are Jesus' commands to us. So, why? We should learn to fish. Well, then it moves on to this. How do we learn to fish? You know, it's one thing to say, yeah, I know how to go fishing. I know how to be reaching souls. I know how to be giving out the gospel. I know evangelism is part of the Christian life. 
But the Lord never tells us to do anything that he doesn't equip us to do it. So, two main things I want you to see into this point. How do we learn to fish? First of all, we learn, or by learning from the master fisherman himself. By learning from the master fisherman. You know, Jesus is the great example of all things in Scripture. He is the great fisherman. He's the sower. He's the shepherd. He's the preacher. He's the, he's the great man of prayer. He's the, the great man of worship. He's the friend of sinner. He's the helper of the, of the lowly and the outcast. We learn everything from Him. Everything from Him. In that verse there in Matthew 4.19 that I quoted a minute ago about Jesus telling them, I'll make you fishers of men. First thing He said though, I want to catch this. When He first approached those men, Simon and Andrew on the seashore there, it says, And He saith unto them, Follow Me, and I will make you fishers of men. See that? Follow me. Learn from the master fisherman himself. He said, follow me, guys, and I'll show you how to catch fish. Now, Jesus was such an, a master at reaching people and how he did it. We can learn so many lessons from him. Five quick things I want to put under this first point, and that is some things we learned about fishing from Jesus. Number one, be patient. Be patient. You know, the Lord was so patient with people. He didn't get all upset if they didn't listen to him the first time, or he, if it took him several times to reach somebody. Think how many times he went by. Apparently, Matthew's a great example of this. The Bible says that Matthew was a tax collector. He was sitting at the uh, place where he worked, the receipt of custom, where people would come pay their taxes. And one day, all of a sudden, Matthew finally leaves and follows Christ. But that wasn't just like on a whim. He didn't just do that the first time. Jesus, no doubt, had been preaching in that area, talking to Matthew, no doubt, conversing with him. We don't have every detail of every conversion story in the Bible, but I'll guarantee you, these people just didn't all of a sudden, like a robot, decide to follow Christ. He was patiently working with them, all of them. We need to be patient. Hey, you're not going to win somebody over to Christ in the first meeting necessarily. Maybe, maybe it might take ten times to meet with someone. It might take you working with them months and maybe even years. It could be a family member that's so stubborn and rejecting the gospel, but you still got to work with it. Be patient. Number two, Jesus knew his audience. He knew his audience. Boy, is that important. You see all these different stories of Jesus preaching and, and working with people one-on-one. -on -one. One of the great comparisons is found in the Gospel of John. In John 3, Jesus deals with a very religious man by the name of Nicodemus. He's pretty, pretty firm. He's kind of short with Nicodemus. He's very strong with Nicodemus because Nicodemus should have known some things. He said, you're a teacher in Israel. Know not all these things? But then the very next chapter, he meets a, a woman by a well in Samaria. He's very tender with her. He's much more patient in his approach. He knew his audience. Depending on who you're trying to reach, you've got to know where they stand. Know what their background is a little bit. Know what they've went through. That'll help you, help me to be able to try to reach them in a better way. Number three, Jesus used illustrations, didn't he? Jesus used illustrations. Most of Jesus' preaching in the Gospels, he's, he's referring to things. The lilies of the field, the birds of the air, the sea, the, the crops, the fields, the sower went forth and sowed his seed. He uses illustrations. You and I, if we're going to reach people, we need to be using illustrations that are, that are current, that will apply to the people we're talking to. If I'm talking to somebody who's totally unchurched, has no church background, no Christian background, I'm not going to use church kind of related things. I'm not going to talk about things that they would know. I'm going to use other things. I'm going to try the best I can to use things that might apply to them. Number four, another thing Jesus did that we're learning from the master fisherman on, he asked questions a lot. Boy, that's a great thought. That's a, such a great approach. You know, I, I've said this before, but maybe some of you weren't here when I've used this comment before, but when I was taught evangelism in Bible college 30-some years ago now, I went to Bible college 80, 85 to 88, I remember taking a course in personal evangelism, and our instructor told us that, you know, you, you just pretty much... Take over the conversation, keep the person on focus, and don't let them get you off track. And if they ask any questions, just squelch that and get back to the gospel. I'm not questioning the person's motives, and I know he cared about souls. He was trying to do his best to tell us how we could win souls, but I found that to be terrible advice. 
uh, if I'm preaching a sermon at someone, uh, I better do that on Sunday morning from the pulpit like I'm doing now, not to them one-on-one. They don't want to hear a sermon. Most people won't want, want you preaching at them. So asking questions, Jesus used it often. People would come to him and he'd say, uh, how about this? What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? Uh, he? You know, By what authority do these things? And Jesus would say, by what authority did, did John baptize? You know what I mean? Jesus so often would bring his audience in by questions because questions make people think. And as they think, they've got to really grapple with what they really believe if they're going to answer. Fifthly, this is a great one, Jesus never watered down his message. Never did he water down his message. He never changed his theology, his, his uh, soteriology, his way of salvation. He didn't say, you know, that woman at the well, now, you know, she's been living with a man in sin, so I better not get into that subject because, you know, if I start talking about sin to her, she might, she might run off. No, he said, you, you've been married five times, you're living with a man right now. Now, he said it in a loving way, I'm sure, but he never watered down the message. He never changed his doctrine, his, 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 meth, his, uh, his message uh, because of the people he talked to. He always was preaching the same message, you need to be born again. You need to repent and come to me. And so we can learn from that. Now, let me get into some more detail on the second point. So how we learn to fish, we first learn, of course, from the master fisherman. But number two, by following some simple steps. By following some simple steps. Now, these are just kind of going to correlate between actual fishing and fishing for men. Six points, real quick. Six things if you're going to catch fish literally, if you're going to catch fish spiritually. You have to have these. Number one, preparing. You've got to prepare to go fishing. I remember I told you my Uncle Steve always took me fishing. And, and, but, but fishing didn't start the morning we got up. It started the night before, at least. He's getting all these poles ready. He's relining his poles. He need, he's making sure his tackle box is all set up. He's not losing. He, maybe he needed to buy some things prior to the day we went out. Uh, he's getting lunch stuff ready. He's got coolers ready to go in the morning. You prepare. You get out there. You don't just want to get there half cocked and not know what you're going to do. And you and I, if we're going to catch men, we've got to be prepared. That's why I, I just don't, don't enjoy hearing. I don't buy the whole argument. Well, I just don't know how to witness. I just don't know what to say. Well, if you don't know what to say, what are you doing to prepare to say anything? What are you doing to prepare yourself to be involved in evangelism? See, God's not going to take that as a valid excuse one day. Well, I just didn't tell anybody about Christ because I, I didn't know how. What are you doing to get, get ready? Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself to understand. You, you all ought to always have a, a presentation of the gospel, a couple of great points you want to bring out. And if you need help, we're here as a church to help you. I'm here to help you personally. We put out a Bible study on our website, The Seven Essentials of Salvation. You can use those basic ideas. But get ready. Prepare yourself. Secondly, not only are you preparing, you've got to be going. It doesn't do you any good to prepare everything perfectly. And you never go. What if my Uncle Steve would have got all those things ready, and then in the morning we never got up anywhere? <laughs> that would have been foolish. you got to go. You prepare yourself to be a witness for Christ, but then you got to actually start approaching some people. you got to start sharing the gospel with people. you got to go. Now let's go on to number three. Uh, you got to be preparing, going, baiting your hook. you got to be baiting your line. Uh, hey, you know, you get out there. Not boats, I've been on the banks, whatever we fished at. Hey, you finally get out there all excited. You don't just sit there and look at the water. You start getting your poles in, you start putting some bait on. You put a lure on there, you put whatever you're going to use. That's baiting the hook. You know what we're doing in evangelism? We've got we to gotta think of the best way to catch that fish. If I'm fishing for a certain kind of fish, I use a certain kind of bait, a certain kind of lure, Right? And when I'm thinking about sinners, like I said before, I've got to know my audience like Jesus did, and I've got to prepare the right bait. I've got to make sure that I'm going to be saying some things that would really touch that person. You know, I used to work at the, uh, at the uh, jail there at the county jail. And at the county jail when I was there, you know, hey, I knew exactly where those guys and those ladies were coming from. I talk a lot about drugs, a lot about pornography, a lot about addictions, because that's what got them there. I wouldn't talk a lot about church things. They didn't need that. They needed to know how to be forgiven of all those sins they'd piled up against God all their lives. You see? You've got to get the right bait. How about number four? Casting. You know, once you get that lure on, you know, what favorite lure, whatever, uh, eventually you better cast that line out. You're not going to catch any fish just looking at the bait sitting on your pole there. You've got to cast it out. 
You've got to start actually making an effort to catch the fish that are out in the water. And if we're going to catch sinners, we've got to take that bait and we've got to actually be casting out. We've got to be doing like Jesus said to those, those men in Luke 5. Cast out the net. Throw out that net. Hey, you've got to make a lot of cast. I watch these guys on Bass Masters, Pro Masters, you know, these, these bass tournaments and other things I watch fishing on TV. It always makes me mad to watch those things. Those guys are pulling in fish all the time. And, <laughs> but I know it's just they're recording only when they catch fish. I know, I'm not dumb, but it just makes you jealous when you watch those shows. But you know what? Those guys have to do a lot of casting. They, and they're great at it, man. I, I never could, could get as good as those guys. They're unbelievable. Those guys, will, they'll find a little pocket about two by two I, I, I don't know, on a bank where they think a big, large mouth bass is hanging out. They'll lay that, that lure right there in that spot. Man, I'd be in a tree somewhere. I'd be on the bank stuck on some rocks. That's where I'd be. But, see, casting. You, you've got to actually cast the bait. You've got to go out and you've got to actually try to win someone to Christ. Okay? You've got to actually do it. Now, then there's number five. This is a great one. It's called landing a fish. You know, you cast, man. You're casting, you're casting. When you finally get a bite, you've got to actually hook that fish, Right? You know, they get the little barbs, you're using a treble hook or whatever, single hook. Uh, you still, a lot of times you still have to land, you have to set the hook, they call it, right? And that's not always easy, but it's essential. Hey, I've had some really good strikes, and all of a sudden, it's gone. He, he spit the lure out, or it just cut through his mouth or something, I didn't get him. Man, that's discouraging. I mean, you feel like you, you knew you had a good, or, or your line will break. I've, I've hit a couple of fish over the years. I know it had to be good size. And I know by the, by the feel on the, on the line in my pole, but it snapped the line. If you don't have good, good line on, good, good new fishing line. Here's the lesson. Hey, if, you, if you're out there trying to witness the sinners, and, and you can see they're ready, you've got you to land them. You know, you don't just beat around the bush, you know, friend, you need to be saved. I used to do this. I was always a little fearful of the landing part of evangelism. It's always kind of the most, well, I don't want to call it awkward, but it, it, I never felt like I was really that good at it, but I finally learned you just have to do it. Say you've been witnessing somebody, and you can see they're under conviction. You're watching their life. You're, you're answering their questions. You're, you're, you're hearing things from them that show you that they're ready to be saved. But you know what you finally have to do? Hey, friend, call on the Lord. That's the landing. Hey, you know what? You need to call on Christ. You need to repent. You've heard it all. You know what you've got to do, friend. What's holding you back? See, the hook is in their mouth. Wham! You've got to set the hook. Or you'll never land them. You've got to land the sinner. And then lastly, and this is number six, because this is so important too. You know, you can be preparing and going and baiting and casting and landing. I like this part the best. Keeping. Keeping the fish. I fished a few places over the years, and this is discouraging for us fishermen, you know this. Uh, they'll have a little sign out there at the, at the lake, catch and release. Man, I hated that. I didn't want to release that fish after I put all this work into catching them. I want to take them home, fry them up. I want to eat them, right? And I understood they were trying to keep certain fish in there and keep their numbers up and catch and release. I understand all that. But you know what? Hey, when it comes to evangelism, God, He keeps people. And He wants you and I to have some fish that stay. I'm talking about true converts here. I'm talking about people that really last. Now, every person involved in fishing for souls has had this happen. You'll have it happen if you haven't already. You'll have somebody to respond to the gospel through your witnessing, and, you, and it'll look like they're really on the line. you got them coming in. And all of a sudden, poof, they're gone. I remember my uncle used to tell me, hey, if you don't got that fish in your hand or on the boat or on the bank, you didn't catch it. It doesn't matter what you say you had on the line. That's not a catch. You literally have to bring them in. You have to be holding on to them, right? And, and the whole idea of, of catching uh, is, is been embellished by all the stories of people who said they let the big one go, right? How many stories have we heard about, you know, fish, fishermen are the biggest liars because we're always talking about the fish we missed, the fish we didn't catch. I love the story I heard uh, of about a guy who went fishing all morning long. He didn't catch a thing. His wife knew he was out there by himself. So he said, man, I'm going to be so embarrassed coming back tell my wife we're going to get anything. So he stopped by the, the uh, grocery store, goes up to the fish counter, tells the guy working behind the fish counter, hey, I want those three big fish there, the biggest ones you got. He said, but wait a minute, don't just wrap them up. Here's what I want you to do. 
It was a weird request. And the, and the guy behind the counter thought, what are, you, what are you asking this for? He said, I want you to throw each of those fish out to me, and I'll catch them, and then I'll give them to you, and then you can wrap them. He said, I won't have to lie to my wife when I get home. He gets all three of these fish, he catches them, gives them back to the guy, he wraps them up, takes them home, and says, honey, look at these fish I caught. Well, he wasn't technically lying, but he really didn't catch those fish. He didn't get to keep what he caught because he didn't catch anything. And you know, one great thing about fishing for souls, God determines what fish are either good fish or not good fish. What a great parable Jesus gave. And I want to read it to you. It's a short one, but it's an excellent parable about, hey, when I go out fishing, all I'm going to do is throw out the line and I let God worry about the catch. Jesus said this, Matthew 13, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea. Now, most of the fishing in the New Testament and the Gospels is net fishing. They're fishing for big amounts. This is a making a living kind of thing. But there was angle. They called it angle. An angle is a hook. They did some hook fishing, but mainly casting nets. So just understand the meaning. That was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be, look at the illustration and, and the fulfillment of it, what it really was speaking of. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever, separate the wicked from among the just and shall cast into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now you talk about the ultimate catch and release that's going to happen. Jesus just tells you and I, tells our church, we're just to throw out the net. We're to cast out the line as much as we can and catch all that we can and bring all that we can in. And he'll sort through the rest. There's people in this church, I'm sure, have been in every church I've been in, every church you've ever been in or will be in, that are not even saved. They come to church. They may be on the membership rolls, but they've been saved. But we can't always know that. We don't know exactly who they are. You know what we're to do? We welcome them. We work with them. We try to help them. One day, though, God's going to separate the true from the false, the good fish from the bad fish. And so all these ways that we learn to follow these simple examples. Now, let me finish with this. Not only did we answer the question why we should learn to fish, boy, we need to learn how we should fish, how we learn to fish. Boy, we've got to learn from the master. We've got to put into practice some of these steps. But the last one is this. What finally determines a catch? What finally determines a catch? Hey, we can do all those first two points and be really up on them, but then how are we finally going to know that we've got a catch? This is what determines it. First of all, obedience. Obedience. We're never going to catch any fish if we don't go fishing. I mean, I know that sounds so elementary and so basic, but it's so true. We've got to go fishing. We've got to reach people. We've got to do something. What are you doing right now, friend, to see someone come to Christ? Are you doing anything? I mean, I've had people, you know, they've cast stones at me and my methods before, and, you know, that doesn't work, this works. Okay, fine, yeah, you can criticize all you want. But, you know, I always ask them, what are you doing, though? Let me, let me hear your methods. You know what I find out? Most people that criticize people that are trying to win people aren't winning anybody themselves. They're just being hypercritical. No, hey, if you don't want to use anything I've told you about, that's fine. I don't care how you do it. But are you doing something to fish for souls? That's what it's all about. Try to get people saved. You say, well, I can't, I can't talk well. I don't know all the verses to use. Okay, are you giving out tracts? Are you inviting people to church? Are you recommending them to get on our website? Are you trying to talk to them, at least give your own testimony? Maybe write your own testimony track like these. Are you doing that? Doing something, okay? So obedience, we've got to obey. Again, I told you, there's no options. There's no suggestions here. This isn't an either or, multiple choice kind of question to answer. There's no other choices. This is it. We're supposed to be reaching souls. Every one of us working in the Lord's church is to be winning the lost. Number two, not only does obedience determine a catch, but faith determines a catch. Wow, does faith determine a catch. I told you several of these very similar like stories from, from our text in Luke 5 are found in the Gospels. And every time, it seems like the apostles have been fishing all night and catch nothing. 
And every time it's the Lord that brings the fish in. I love John 21. It's the end of the Gospel of John. It's after the resurrection. It's one of my favorite stories in that precious Gospel. And Peter has went back to fishing. And Peter tells the other guys, six of them follow him, I go a-fishing. He goes back to the Sea of Galilee. They go out all night. Guess what? They caught nothing. Zero. The Bible says in the morning they're about ready to get to shore. They're all discouraged, worn out, you know, beat up, tired. They see someone on the shore. Have you any meat? Have you, did you catch anything? <laughs> they all admit no. How embarrassing that was. These professional fishermen still. Nope, didn't catch a thing. And all of a sudden it says Peter knew it was the Lord and John. Peter dives in the water and swims on him. You know the story. But here's the blessing. Guess what he fed them when they got to the shore? Fish. Fish. He didn't just have some. They brought, they brought some fish with them. Yeah. They caught some when the Lord told them where to throw it out. But he already had on the coals, on the fire, ready to eat some fish. You know what the lesson he was teaching? Hey, I not only can show you where to catch them and how to catch them, but I'll catch them for you and clean them for you, and you can eat them right from me. What a great lesson. That's the faith we have to have. Hey, I've said this so, so many times over the years, it's the only thing that keeps me going. I'm not responsible for how many people come to Christ. I'm responsible for trying to fish for them. I'm responsible for trying to get the word out. I'm, I'm trying to get people saved. I'm trying to tell them about Christ. If they thumb their nose at me and turn their back on me and throw something on the ground in front of me, uh, curse my name, I've had all that happen. I, that's not my business. What I'm to do is have the faith to keep witnessing and sharing the gospel with people. Third thing, not only is obedience and determined to catch, teamwork. Teamwork. I love the part of this story, and back to our original text from Luke 5, where it says, remember when they got this huge catch in their net? Uh, Peter and John, uh, or, or, or Simon and Andrew, basically, probably the brothers, and they can't even get it to into their boat. It says, and they beckoned, they motivated, they hollered unto their partners, which were in the other ship, and that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. Wow, what a great team effort. That's what the church is about with evangelism. This is one of my big, big burdens. Is that yes, we teach evangelism, but we teach it in the right place. I love anybody, and I am a supporter of any. I love Ray Comfort. I love Mark Cahill. I love Todd Friel. I love all those guys. They're heroes to me. And I would, I would sit and talk to them and shake their hand and thank them for everything I've gotten from them over the years. They're great men. But one thing I differ from them is they don't do it through the local church. I think they're missing the boat. If I can use that little pun. They're missing the boat. Because all evangelism was supposed to be done through the church. And you know the boat, I just mentioned missing the boat. The reason I said that is because when Jesus told them to go out and they were in a boat, the boat pictures the church. There's no doubt about it. Every commentator you read will tell you that, and I agree with them. The boat is a picture of the church. And casting the net out to the right side is a picture of doing it the right way by Christ's design. You know when Jesus told the apostles at one time, cast your net out to the right side of the ship for a catch. Do you think they'd have caught anything if they'd have done it to the left side? No, that's disobedient. I don't think they would have caught a single thing. See, this is the teamwork part of it. Man, it's a wonderful thing. Sometimes on Wednesday night, Sunday afternoon, we'll, we'll talk about praying for people, and somebody will say, pray for so-and-so that I'm witnessing to him, I'm sharing the gospel with him. That's exciting. Those are, to me, the, the most special prayer requests we could be asking and, and calling out to God for. God, move in circumstances and move upon their hearts. We know God wants people to say, but people have to respond. It's a team effort, though, because once a person does respond, then we bring them into the mainstream of the church. Wasn't it a joy to see young Ivan join our church last Sunday? What a blessing. Here he is again today. You know what? Ivan was saved a little over a year ago. He comes to church. He found out about our church. We didn't even reach him. He found out about us. He found out who we were. Came to us. Thank God for that. And I talked to him about getting baptized, and he came and joined the church. Going to get baptized soon? See, it's a team effort. See, it doesn't stop with just getting somebody to make a profession of faith. Then we bring them into the mainstream of church life. That's what the New Testament teaches, a team effort. 
Number four, another thing that we have to do to determine a catch, you have to have persistence. You've got to have persistence. Man, remember, they, they toiled all night, it said in our text. And when Jesus first asked him, it's like Peter is, he's kind of speaking for the whole group. Lord, come on, man. We've already done this all night. Go out again, Peter. That's persistence. I haven't had anybody, here, here, here's you and I, here's how we think. I'm just going to think into your mind like mine. I haven't had anybody responding to the gospel yet. Now, I'm not going to keep doing it. Well, you've already defeated your, yourself. You've already quit what you should be doing. Keep going. Don't give up. Be persistent. Hey, I know one thing about fishing. <laughs> I learned this from that time I was an eight-year-old kid sitting at that tank pond in front of that house. I guarantee one thing. You, if you only went fishing because you caught fish every time, you'd never keep fishing. There's plenty of times. Darling, don't answer. There's plenty of times I go fishing, don't catch a single thing, but I still go when I can because I'm, I'm hooked on fishing. I've had plenty of people reject the gospel uh, for me and my attempts to try to win them over the years. And I could have got a really bad attitude about it. I could have got really discouraged about it. I could have got really bitter over it. Oh, you wicked sinners. Won't turn to Christ. That's not the right answer. Paul said, preach the word in season, out of season. He meant all the time. All the time. And then lastly, this is a great one I want to add because it stresses a point I made earlier, but I think this is so important. One final aspect of determining a catch is location. Location. Let me, let me use this analogy. I've fished at a lot of state parks, big lakes, Joe Poole, Ray Roberts, all kinds of lakes around here. I have to tell you, now, now you guys might, who, ladies, whoever else fishes around here, I know some of you guys fish. Alan has a nice boat. Some people fish here. You might have been very successful. I don't have a boat, and so I've got to fish off the bank, and I've never been that successful at these big, huge state park lakes. Even when I lived up in Ohio for a year, same thing. I'll tell you where I've been the most successful, though. These little private tank ponds. Man, they're full of fish. I've never caught so many fish in my life as some of these places I've went fishing, these little tank ponds. And here's what I want to see by that. The location of where you fish will determine how much you catch. Catch fish close by. Catch fish where you know they're at. Hey, why would I want to drive all the way hours and hours to a state park if I had a tank? Well, my dream is, my wife tell you this, my dream is for me to one day buy a piece of property that's big enough for me to put a tank pond on. I'm going to stock that baby to the limit when I do. I'll tell you right. I'm going to stock the baby as full as those fish can get in there. You know why? Because I'm not going to drive two, two hours to some state park and catch nothing where I can go out to a tank pond Hardly ever fished at. Those fish haven't seen those lures. I haven't seen that bait. Man, they'll hit everything you throw in that water. I'm going to fish close by. Hey, why would I be involved in fishing for strangers if I haven't first, first tried to win my own family? You have an unsaved person in your family? Son, daughter, father, mother, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, I don't care how extended, whatever. That's your first location. That's your tank pond. That's who you need to be trying to reach first. Hey, are you going to be more upset when one day you stand before or with all the saints and God is casting the wicked into hell at the great white throne judgment? Revelation 20, you read it. Are you going to be more upset when all these strangers from all parts of the world, a casting lake of fire, and all of a sudden, here comes your, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father. Are you going to be more upset when God says to them, away in everlasting darkness, prepared for you and the devil and his angels. I'll tell you, you're going to be more upset. I'm going to be more upset. Fish close by. Pray for your unsaved family. Reach them with the gospel. Invite them to church. Give them information to study. Live the right kind of testimony around them. Well, I conclude with the point that I wanted to say for last because it's really a catch-all and an end-all to the whole subject. How are we going to fish? How are we going to learn to fish? Pray for a catch. Pray for a catch. Did you catch what Jesus said? See that? Play on words, catch. And he entered into one of the ships... 
verse 3 of our text, which was Simon's. And I love how the King James translated this. And prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. Now we know that word prayed him means to urge and to compel, but why did they use that word? It's, it's the great Greek word. It's a Greek word. It means to pray, to urge, like we urge God in prayer. And they put that there in a good way because it really gets to this whole heart of what it means to learn to fish. We've got to pray for a catch. If you don't do anything else today about evangelism, you walk out here, forget this entire message, don't do anything else, if you would at least, bare minimum, starting block, point A, start praying every day for an unsaved family member, an unsaved neighbor, friend, co-worker, whoever, you'll have already started fishing. Now, I told you there's more to it. I didn't say that's the end of fishing, but you're starting to fish. That's better than not doing any fishing. Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his field. And I like to say that applies to you and I as, as this church, as our membership. We are praying for a harvest, but we've got to get out and work and fish. Let's pray. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Learning how to fish. Wow. Whether you've actually done any physical fishing, literal fishing for fish in a, in a lake, in a pond, or wherever, that's not as important as the kind of fishing we talked about today. This fishing the Lord calls us to is eternal. It's everlasting. The catch from this kind of fishing will give us eternal dividends. I'm just going to pray in a moment. We'll stand to our feet. We'll have our usual invitational time. And it's going to be a time for you to think about, first of all, Christian. I'm, I've really preached a course to Christians today, church members especially. Are you fishing? Who are you fishing for? Who are you trying to reach? Maybe today, like I said, if all you can do is leaving today with a commitment to pray, this message would have been all worth preaching to you. You're going to try to win that person and you're going to pray, God, maybe I don't know everything I should yet, how to win them, but God, would you help me get prepared? Would you help me have the courage, the boldness I'm going to need to share the gospel with them? Would you help me pray for them and love them enough to care about them and call them and get in touch with them and stay in touch with them? Hey, I know exactly where all this is at. I do it all the time. I have family. Many of my, most of my family is unsaved. My wife and I, we've been trying to reach my family and some of her family for our whole Christian experience. 30, going on 38 years. A lot of them aren't still saved. But you know what? I haven't given up. I still keep an open door with all of them. There's been a few that have shown some interest. We're getting a little closer to landing that fish. We've got to nibble. But friend, you've got to be fishing. After I pray, we'll stand to our feet. We'll ask God to move on every heart and teach us to fish. Dear Lord, we thank you for this great truth of evangelism. Lord, I think of how many people were involved in Darlene and I being saved so many years ago. God, if it wasn't for people fishing, a church, a little church that cared about fishing, people like her grandfather cared about our soul, we would have never been caught. We'd have been lost forever. I pray you'll help all of us to learn to fish and that God, your hand will be upon it. Bless this message, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand quietly.